my brother will never break contact. If he's not contacting any of us, he's talking to my dad all day long. And that was another big red flag. We're just asking in Jesus name that somebody will come forth and do the right thing. But we can bury Charles. That was the family of missing person Charles Taylor. And as you could hear in those comments, it doesn't sound like there is a lot of hope that he is still alive. But if justice is needed, this family needs to know where he is. So we're still looking for a missing person. Ultimately, we're still looking for Charles Taylor. This is a case that has a lot of exposure initially around his disappearance through the first year, kind of trails off towards the end of that. And considering that we're about three months away from the second year anniversary, really for the past six, eight months, there hasn't been a peep. I think it's time that we stand behind this family. I think it's time to turn on the searchlight for Charles Taylor. Welcome back to Brain Scratch Searchlight. I'm John Lorden. Thank you so much for caring about these cases like I do. And before we get started today, I want to give a special thank you to Gwen, longtime Brain Scratcher, also a writer over on the Seriously Mysterious podcast. Gwen started looking into this case and saying, you know what, John, I think this needs an episode of Searchlight. Uh, she sent it my way. And as soon as I looked into it, I, it was easy to agree with. Uh, like I mentioned during the intro, this is a case that gets some local coverage and then it just completely trails off. Looks like there might be, you might have a family and law enforcement kind of at odds with each other. And there's definitely a change that happens at some point in the investigation. We're going to go through all that as we kind of reconstruct the events using the available news sources. Uh, also, Jason Hebert did do an interview with the family. I'm going to kind of weave in a couple things that I heard during that interview. Of course, I have links to everything that we're going through in the description box down below, so you can check it out for yourself. As usual, let's go ahead and get started with NamUs so we can understand the basics of this case. But right off the bat, we run into a problem. There are 51 missing persons cases with the last name Taylor. Not one of them is for Charles. We don't have a NamUs record. I'm not exactly sure why. That can mean, it could mean a few different things. It could mean just that law enforcement has not created a record for some reason. Um, of course, we know that citizens can also create a record. No one has created a record here or tried to. But there's another possibility. Uh, even when a citizen enters a record here, NamUs goes through a verification process where they reach out to law enforcement. Occasionally, law enforcement will say, don't post that because there's a pending development hap happening. Uh, and in many cases, it is that these, the situation is transitioned to a homicide situation or something like that. We don't know what it is in this particular instance. I'm going to go through the information with you guys here today, kind of with an eye towards trying to collect enough information for a NamUs profile. And I got to tell you, even though this case got some decent coverage right off the top, there's a couple of just basic missing persons facts that are needed just to even put a decent poster together that I can't quite find. So uh, it might be a situation where I have to reach out to the family to kind of get the last results or the last questions answered so I can get this NamUs entry created. That's kind of my secondary goal today as we're going through this here together. What about a missing persons poster? Do a search for Charles Taylor missing poster? Nothing. Nothing comes up. You get another one, but that's not for Charles. Um, it's a challenge right off the bat. Now, if you dig a little deeper, just in regular Google results, you will see a great organization called Be United Missing Persons. They have put a poster together. Uh, so we, here we can get at least some of the basics. Charles, also called Chuck Taylor, missing September 20th, 2020. Missing from Williamson, West Virginia. Black hair, brown eyes. Uh, he's a black male at the age of 35 at the t at the time that he went missing. So now he would be probably coming up on 37, if not 37 already. Really important fact in here. Charles is legally blind and also suffers from a mental condition. He doesn't have any medication with him. So even if we were talking about back in September of 2020 or October of 2020, when we were looking at this case, 
big cause for concern uh, for someone that needs medication, doesn't have it with them. And then on top of that, we're talking about someone that that is legally blind as well. Uh, they have contact information here. I don't believe this contact information is valid anymore. So please use the contact information that you see on the screen if you do have some information to call in. That is for the state police, uh, which we'll, we'll get into those developments about how that all happened as we continue forward here. So right off the bat, I know many of you have experience with seeing missing persons posters pretty frequently. Uh, some big facts that are missing there. Uh, number one, height, weight, and clothing description. Pretty critical information for a missing persons poster. And I'm not trying to knock be United missing persons. I'm telling you, after going through all this information, I was having trouble finding some of those details. I found one or two details, but I don't have everything. Um, so that's that's kind of the challenge here. But let's see if we can learn a little bit about Chuck from his Facebook page. Uh, obviously, in many pictures that I see of him, he is wearing uh, Converse All-Stars, also known as Chuck Taylors. We can see here in his graphic, it looks like these are like slippers almost that have been uh, crocheted that are in the style of Chuck Taylors. Uh, 206 friends for his overview, went to Clark Central High School, lives in Charleston, West Virginia, from Athens, Georgia. Not a lot of additional information here. Now I can tell you, once again, thanks to Jason Hebert's work over on his channel, uh, his family does share that Chuck is a father, basically uh, had a long-term relationship in Athens, Georgia, had several children from that relationship, and then moved to West Virginia, uh, is with, in a new relationship with a woman for a few years at the time that he goes missing. I don't think there's really anything else that's gonna come up here. We've, we've already hit on Clark Central High School. We've hit on the two places lived. Um, there's really just not much. We got a cousin that pops up here. Nothing listed for life events. Uh, really hard. And it, it, he's not like a very active user. You can see his profile picture was last updated in 2014. Just not a big uh, Facebook user. But let's go ahead and continue just learning about this area where this disappearance happened. That is Williamson, West Virginia. Williamson is a city in Mingo County, West Virginia, United States, situated along the Tug Fork River. Population, 3,191 as of the 2010 census. So we're talking about a pretty rural area. You can kind of get a sense here of in this picture. I mean, it looks like that's kind of their main street. There's probably not a whole lot of businesses off this street. Uh, it is the county seat of Mingo County, and it's the county's largest and most populous city. So actually, this whole county uh, probably fairly rural in terms of what's out there. Local economy largely fueled by coal mining, transportation, healthcare, and retail businesses. Uh, let's go ahead and continue getting to some articles here and see if we can get some of these details. This one was originally posted September 28th, 2020 over at WYMT.com. It's been more than a week since Charles Taylor, 35 years old, was reported missing from Williamson. Williamson police said he was reported missing September 20th. Another thing I want to point out is uh, it seems like there's some variations. I'm hearing from different comments, different sources. There might be some question about the day that he actually goes missing. It seems like one of his family members actually last speaks to him on September 17th. And the family members are saying they would be in contact daily. So it's kind of strange to not hear from him on the 18th, 19th. But he is officially reported missing by September, or the official report says September 20th is when he actually goes missing. Taylor's sister, Dominique Taylor, uh, she's worried about his safety because he is blind and also suffers from a mental illness. Uh, we don't have details, and I haven't found any clear details in terms of the mental illness. One of the things that the family does talk about in Jason's interview is uh, he certainly deals with some depression uh, from time to time. Now, I don't know if that is a clinical diagnosis. I don't know if that's the me mental illness that they're referring to here. But that's the only sense that I've gotten about um, things that he could possibly be dealing with in, in that aspect. He keeps in contact with us constantly, and if he felt like he was upset or that he wanted to leave, he would have called us by now. Nine days, said his sister, Dominique. Taylor's brother, Chadwick, says he talks to his brother almost every day and is concerned about how much time has passed since he's heard anything. It's like he just fell off the face of the earth, Chadwick said. No one knows where he is at. He hasn't given any signs. There is no hint. 
Dominique worries that her brother may have wandered off and could just be lost. I mean, very big concern if, if, if he has side issues. And especially once we start looking at the area, I think you guys are going to understand that a little more. Um, quote, that is a very rural area. And with him being blind, he could have wandered off anywhere, she said. You literally walk out of the apartment and right across the street is railroad tracks and a highway. Uh, and not only that, let's go ahead and jump to a map real quick. Uh, this is the address for his apartment complex. And she wasn't joking. Uh, I don't even think it's literally across the street. Like you, the highway is the street, it looks like. Let me go ahead and kick this layer on here. Uh, yeah, it's a highway right there. And then just beyond the highway, not just like one set of tracks, multiple sets of railroad tracks. Um, from some descriptions I'm seeing, they're saying that occasionally um, railroad cars will actually be parked here. I don't know if that's on these additional tracks. I think that's these guys over here. I mean, look at this. It is just, I would say it almost looks like a, like a rail yard, but it's just super, super thick with all these different tracks and all these different cars that are sitting there. Uh, of course, a few other points here, um, right up on the border of Kentucky. And we mentioned it during the description, the Tug Fork River. So we do have a water source here. Um, definitely cause for concern on that. And then, of course, with it bordering Kentucky, possibilities that uh, he could have wound up in another state. We know that sometimes law enforcement doesn't always communicate the best, you know, across state lines. I would think in this instance, you know, probably they're close enough to each other. They're aware of each other enough that someone would have made a phone call over there. But that's why systems like NamUs are so important. We know that NamUs tracks not only missing persons, but unidentified bodies. If you have an unidentified body pop up in Kentucky, you got a missing person that's in West Virginia, NamUs is going to figure that out. So part of the reason why I'm, I'm really big on that program and I really want to make sure we get his record entered or at least get some confirmation that, you know, um, law enforcement doesn't want this record posted at this time, something along those lines, which NamUs wouldn't necessarily come back and tell you exactly what the conditions are. They just kind of tell you, uh, you know, we're not going to post that entry that, that you put in there, which is enough info for me to understand that there's something else that's going on with it. But please say there is no sign of foul play in Taylor's disappearance, but they're concerned since he doesn't have his medication. Um, over at WYMT, they do an update on September 28th. A search party is being organized in Williamson to help find a man who's been missing more than a week. Kind of unfortunate, like to think that, you know, this missing person gets called in on September 20th, which might already be a day or two after he's gone missing. And it's over a week after that, before we get some kind of big search effort going on. It's, uh, it's a little heartbreaking, especially for... A missing persons case that should be treated as an endangered case typically i'm pretty sure his medical diagnosis alone would put it as an endangered missing persons case so kind of interesting to me that we're seeing this time lag like this off the bat uh the williamson police department made that an amount announcement taylor who is blind and suffers from a mental illness hasn't been seen since september 20th Police say they're reaching out to the community to help find Taylor, along with Williamson officers, West Virginia State Police Troopers, and Mingo County Sheriff's deputies that will help in the search. Williamson Mayor Charles Hatfield also will participate. Uh, don't always hear about that, that the mayor is actually getting out there and helping as well. Over at WilliamsonDailyNews.com, community police assists family in search of missing man. So they get out there. We can see pictures from the search efforts here. Let's learn a little bit more about what they found and what happens around this. Several of Taylor's family members traveled to Williamson on Wednesday, desperate for answers. Chastity Taylor, Chuck Taylor's sister, said she had not spoken with her brother in 13 days. Quote, hopefully we were able to find him alive, but with him being gone so long, it's like our chances are slim, she said. So if anything, we would like to find my brother's remains so we can give him a proper burial. Uh, that's just heartbreaking to know. Um, only a few weeks into it. And if I was in that situation, I'd be trying to keep some form of hope alive around this. But uh, it's it's it, it just seems like they're extremely worried because of the conditions he's dealing with, because of the area that he's gone missing. Um, it, it seems like they, they really lose hope kind of early in all this. 
We appreciate everyone's help. If anyone sees him, please contact me or the Williamson Police Department. My brother has a mental illness and has been off his medication, so it probably would not be a good idea to interact with him. Joining the Williamson Police Department in the search for Charles Taylor was the Williamson Fire Department, the Mingo County Sheriff's Office, the Belfry Vol Volunteer Fire Department, the Pike County Sheriff's Department, and a group of city officials, family members, and volunteers. Sounds like it's, it's a really strongly mounted effort, it sounds like, especially if we're talking about an area this rural. They're pulling in police services, law enforcement services, fire department services from all these different places. On top of that, drone technology was also used during the search by local photographer Wes Wilson. Now, the family in Jason's interview, you know, they're, they're upset about how a lot of stuff has gone with law enforcement is the sense that I get. One of the points they raise is they say that we heard that there was drone stuff done, but we never saw anything from that. We never saw any footage or anything like that. Um, family, if you guys are watching this, we've got the guy's name right here, Wes Wilson. Uh, I'd say try to find this guy. If he's a local photographer, he's probably going to be running a business, should be like a Facebook search to get in touch with this guy and ask him. I would just ask him for, hey, you know, do you have a copy of this this drone flyover that you did? And in particular, if we have a clothing description where we have particular or specific colors that we could look for, you know, it's one thing to say, yeah, we, we've run a drone over there. It's another thing to say that, well, we've gotten drone footage and it's being processed properly. It, it either needs eyes or it needs software. It needs one of those two things. It's not enough to just fly the drone, capture all this footage, which is usually gigs and gigs of footage. I mean, think of how many 30 frames per second, 30 individual pictures for every second of footage that that thing's up there. Um, it's not enough to just capture it. You need it anal analyzed as well. So it could be that Wes did that work, got all that footage captured, and they didn't run it through uh, either manual searching or some type of programmatic searches looking for color variations and things like that. Uh, so, and, and by the way, uh, family members, if you do reach out to Wes, if you do get a copy of that stuff and you guys don't know what to do with it next, please contact me and I will definitely get you uh, some help on that front. We could figure out some services that are willing to process that for you guys. Let's keep learning about this search effort over at WSAZ.com. Police mapped a two mile radius for the search from where Taylor was last seen at his apartment. What this is telling me is I think their initial efforts are more of a recovery effort that they're worried there was some type of accident or something that happened to him close to his home. And they're trying to find that. Community members and law enforcement looked in the woods and abandoned houses. Um, I don't have a very good sense. I mean, I guess, yeah, it's all woods. Look at this. So even, you know, like if, if we pinned his apartment as a center and we did a, a two mile radius around that, we're definitely leaning into Kentucky. I'm not seeing anything about them searching anything in Kentucky. Um, and it's just, I mean, the possibility is just as high. I mean, just as likely as him being in any of this wilderness is him being in any of this wilderness. So I'm just kind of curious about the search efforts and, uh, you know, how far that two mile radius is really going to go and something like that. And also an adult that's capable of walking normal speeds can typically go about three miles per hour. Um, even if he was a little bit slower because he has to process where he's walking and things like that. I mean, we're talking days and days that have passed since this. Like, I'm not I'm not trying to be like hypercritical about the approach. I think the approach makes sense if their real consideration is something happened to him that was relatively close to his home. Um, and if you've got enough people to process a two mile radius, very strongly, then you can kind of rule that out. You can say, okay, uh, he got out of this somehow. Does that mean someone came and picked him up? There, there's got to be some other social component at some point. Like, you know, he, he did he get on a bus? Is there other things that they have to look into? I'll tell you a huge question I have in all this and something that I haven't seen addressed anywhere. Um, did he have a cell phone? We're, we're talking 2020 here. Any GPS tracking, any cell phone tracking, pings, I'm not seeing anything about that stuff. Um, I don't know. I don't know, but let's, let's, let's continue here. So uh, we talked about community members, law enforcement looked in the woods and abandoned houses. Uh, Chastity Taylor walked the railroad tracks with her brother's friend. 
Chief Dotson says investigators do have leads. We've got several today, he says, but I can't disclose what they are at this time. We're following up with other agencies, including Charleston, Dunbar Police Department, Charleston Police Department, he said. So once again, just pulling in all these other partners and resources. But interesting to hear him say they have leads. And it's just interesting to hear that coming off the search efforts. I don't know if that means they ran into people in the community and those people had stories that they gave to police department or possibilities, other places to look, something along those lines. But let's get some more details on these efforts over at WCHS-TV. Search parties comb through the woods and streets of Williamson in a two-mile radius from each direction of the Williamson Tower apartments where Taylor lives. Uh, the last time I talked to my brother was the 17th, Sister Chastity Taylor said. That's really weird because I usually talk to my brother every day. Police believe he's off his medication since the last documented refill was September 2nd. Another phrasing I'm just not understanding. This is an ABC and Fox channel, so I'm thinking they've got some decent resources here. Police believe he is off his medication since the last documented refill was September 2nd. Uh, any medication that I've ever taken in my life, every refill is good for a month. Um, it'd be different if they were saying that we know he didn't take his medication with him because we found it in his home. It's just a weird phrasing. His last documented refill was September 2nd. Or are they saying that he was supposed to refill it on September 2nd and he didn't get it? Uh, possibly. Police Chief Grady Dotson said he left his residence around 5.01 a.m., from this building on his own accord. We do not suspect any foul play as far as someone taking him out of the building or threatening his life in any way. Uh, that's interesting. Now we're starting to get some details and this might actually firm up that timeline. So, you know, even if his contact with his sister cuts off on the 17th, it sounds like we have the police chief saying, hey, no, we've we found some source of information. We can see him at 5.01, which is another interesting thing to note. So sounds like it's video footage, 5.01 a.m., I would assume on September 20th, because um, I think they would note if, no, it was actually a different day, we better get that out to the press so that people have that correction, but I don't know. Uh, there were no signs of forced entry or struggle at his apartment. Officials reviewed surveillance footage and interviewed residents and staff, so... It sounds like it was footage from the apartment building. I can tell you based on the interview that Jason did with the family, the family is questionable about that footage. Um, they got in contact with someone that works at the apartment. They were told that basically the cameras don't work, so they're not sure where this is coming from. Um, they said that when they showed up at the search efforts, they were shown a photograph of the back of a person, so they're not even... 100% sure. Like I, I didn't get a sense that they thought that it wasn't necessarily him. Um, but they didn't seem very certain that it was him either. And especially kind of questioning the source of the video, like, where is this coming from? I got to say in Jason's interview in particular, the family, um, really seems concerned that there's something far bigger at play, some type of, uh, you know, like, I don't want to say like a conspiracy necessarily, but some type of cover up that has happened around this case for some reason. I, I didn't quite follow it myself. I really can't explain it well to you. If you want to check it out, just just watch Jason's interview after you're done here. Um, so I just want to let you know kind of where they're at with it. But the official word in the media sounds like the police chief says, no, we, we got him on footage. As, as a matter of fact, it actually gives us a clothing description that we're going to get here uh, pretty soon as well. But not only did we get some leads today, but we also took some evidence from the apartment that might help and assist with the investigation as well. I'd be curious if there was any electronics in the apartment. Um, you know, like if he had a tablet or a laptop or something like that, could that be helpful to them, you know, for them to process that, see what he was searching on? From what his family says, he wasn't really living in this apartment a whole lot. You know, he's been dating this other woman for about two years. She has a separate place. He would stay over there a lot. Uh, his things in the apartment, his family describes it as basically bare bones. There's like a couch and a bed and, and not much more because he's basically living with his girlfriend. All his stuff was somewhere else. Um, let's go ahead and continue here. At the Williamson PD Facebook page on September 30th, we can see that they thank all of the volunteers who showed their support today in assisting with the search for Charles Chuck Taylor. And then we actually have his father also named Chuck Taylor. Thanks to every person who has supported our family, both physically and spiritually. 
blessings of the Lord to everyone. I'm certain we will find my son soon. I got to say, um, every place where I've found public comments on this case, Charles, his father, seems to find it and thanks those people. Uh, he's just very thankful for the attention and the help that people are trying to, to bring to this. Williamson man still missing after community search effort. So obviously we have this large search effort. Um, we have the police chief saying we got some leads out of it, but other than that, we don't find what we're looking for, which is Chuck. Uh, so let's get to some more quotes from Chief Grady Dotson here. Mr. Taylor was reported missing on the 19th or 20th of September by his girlfriend. Chastity Taylor said the last sighting of her brother was a security recording of him leaving Williamson Towers. He was last seen wearing jeans and a red and pink striped t-shirt. Dotson said he has tattoos on both forearms. So finally, we're getting some description of what he's last seen wearing, assuming that this is good information, which like I mentioned, it seems like the family's not 100% sure on. Um, I'd be curious if they recognize the shirt, if the shirt was one that they had seen him wear before, um, or if his girlfriend would, would recognize that. Uh, and also, now we at least know, yeah, he's got tattoos on both forearms. Uh, honestly, the pictures that I'm showing you down below, those are some of the only photos I could find of him. I don't have great shots of his forearms, so we don't have good descriptions of what those tattoos are. Of course, for the NamUs profile, we'd probably want as good as we can get on those descriptions. Just another thing that I'll be uh, reaching out to the family and asking about trying to help on that. He's never been gone for this long before without being in contact with the family, Chastity told the Mingo Messenger. He lives near the highway in some wooded areas. If he wandered off into the woods, he could have easily gotten lost. I won't discuss his medical condition, says Chief Dodson. I have been in contact with his doctor. I know that Mr. Taylor has been off his medication since September 2nd. I don't believe he's a threat to anyone, but I believe he is a danger to himself. So first kind of inkling that we're getting there about possible uh, self-harm situation. Mr. Taylor is one of seven children, and most of the family lives in Charleston. Chastity Taylor called her brother an introvert and said he only has a few friends in the Williamson area, and he attends a local church. Dominique Taylor, his other sister, said, My brother is not an aggressive person. He just can't see. We are really concerned about him and want to get him home. Chastity said that her brother's disappearance has been hard on the entire family. He's a great guy. He's my best friend. He's a good dad, she said. He calls me every day. He calls me every morning while I'm getting my kids ready for school, and he calls me at night to let me know he's safe. We are all worried. So certainly, if she stopped getting those calls on the 17th, and if they confirmed that he's still around his home and they see him on the 20th, you know, potentially we, we see a change in his pattern, pretty significant change in his pattern if he's usually calling his family, you know, every day and uh, all of a sudden that stops. So is it possible that he's dealing with something in terms of not being on his medications or something like that? I, I think that's certainly a consideration we have to have in this. Continuing at WilliamsonDailyNews.com, the WPD said in a statement on the department's Facebook page on December 8th that they had obtained new evidence that could potentially be related to Taylor's disappearance. We have obtained evidence which has been forwarded to the West Virginia Crime Lab for DNA testing that may be related to the disappearance of Mr. Taylor, although it's too early at this time to say for certain, the statement read. Pending results from the lab, this case continues to be considered a missing person and no arrests have been made. The WPD say they, as well as surrounding agencies, have followed all potential leads, conducted numerous interviews, assisted with polygraph examinations, and conducted several searches to find Taylor since his disappearance. The case remains a top priority, according to the WPD. No details were released on the potential evidence that has been submitted to the WV Crime Lab for testing. Typically, when I see this type of blurb uh, come out about a police department, it's a sign to me that there's some type of conflict that is starting and it's either conflict from the family reacting to the police department or occasionally the community reacting to the police department. And just to be perfectly upfront with you guys, I went looking through the police department, not just for information on this case, just kind of their Facebook page in general and seeing how the community responds to them, reacts to them. I would say they're not very popular in their community or their Facebook page 
just for some reason attracts a lot of trolls. There are people lashing out at this police department fairly regularly. And to be honest, the the approach they're taking with their social media profile, it, it does kind of invite that in a way. Like I see them posting pictures of people that they're arresting, um, which, you know, I, I've seen other police departments do. There's, there's just, there's a strange tone to this, uh, the way it's being done on their Facebook page. I, I really wish that they would rethink that. I don't know what the benefit is of, Hey, we found this person or, you know, we got this person on a DUI and here's a picture of them sitting on a bench in, in our office. Like there's a whole court process that has to happen there. Um, who knows what happens with those charges? I'm just not a hundred percent sure. I, I worry that there's this aspect of them trying to shame the community into behaving by doing that. Cause I don't, I don't see the, the flip side of that. I don't see the benefit to the non-crime committing citizens of them going, Oh good. Now I know that that person who, you know, maybe lives across the street or I see at the store once a week or something, I know that they're, they're driving under the influence. I just, I don't get the benefit of it necessarily. And quite honestly, from what I see on their Facebook page, it causes people to lash out at them. People are, are being pretty upfront about like, why are you showing this? What it, um, but outside of that, I just get the sense that this community, um, not a hundred percent behind the police department here. December 8th, 2020, the WPD is aware of the social media accounts related to the disappearance of Charles Chuck Taylor. We urge the public to not rely on Facebook, TikTok, etc. for accurate information. The WPD, as well as surrounding agencies, are treating this case as top priority and have been working diligently to find Mr. Taylor. The only social media account that I've bumped into on this case uh, is a Facebook page that looks like it was created for this case where there's nothing on it. And I don't know if maybe there was something on it back at the time and now it's been removed, but literally we've got a picture here. We've got someone asking, are there any updates? They're going to write a piece on this. Um, as of March, 2021, we hear that they're planning another search party, but there's nothing else here. It does refer to a TikTok that it looks like was started by his sister. It looks like that account no longer exists. So maybe there was something over there that had upset them. I don't know. This next statement seems to imply that they're trying to address those rumors directly. At this time, no human remains have been found. So part of the interview with Jason Hebert goes into the family hearing that Charles was killed at a particular location. The family goes to that location. They see a glove outside. They're convinced that the glove has blood on it. I don't know if that's what this is a response to. It could be that they raise that to the attention of the police department. And the police department is trying to say, look, no human remains have been found. Essentially, we've tested that item and what you guys think is blood isn't. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to connect the dots here. I don't, these could be completely separate instances. I don't know. Um, I've seen some other comments from the police department in this kind of social media forum stuff where they're saying, Hey, you know, people trying to process this, uh, investigate this crime for themselves could actually be hurting our investigation. Uh, it sounds like one of the family members might've entered that property without the permission of the owner. They're saying that that could be breaking and entering charges, all that kind of stuff. Based on how much time has passed since this incident, this response and all this, and the fact that we still don't have any real movement that has happened on this case, I would say that that location might not have information that actually panned out for the investigation. Or, you know, if, if you're looking at the, the other possibility that his family does bring up, for some reason, this information is being covered up to stop someone from, I don't know, being in trouble. Uh, you know, there's enough things to look at in this case and to, to question how it's being processed that I don't think you would have to go to that level. I mean, just right off the bat, endangered missing persons case. Like, was there any efforts that happened in those first 10 days? I mean, I know, you know, staging a, a, a search effort, you can't just snap your fingers and get that done. But if it was a missing six-year-old, um, do you think that it would have taken 10 or 11 days to get that search effort together? There's no way. There's no way. And that's why we have these different categorizations for missing persons cases. Basically, an endangered case, which he should have been labeled, 
is kind of treated with the priority of those cases similar to a missing six-year-old, at least based on what I've seen in numerous other departments across this country. So there's enough things to look at with this if you really want to you know, be critical of what the police has done here. Um, but let's let's continue with the information that they're putting out. This is them. They've, they've already made this post and they actually kind of respond back to the post to themselves about this. As an update, the WPD continues to investigate and follow up on any leads involving Chuck Taylor. We've conducted multiple searches, including drone by air, boat rescue and recovery in the Tug River. So it's good to hear that there are searches happening in the river as well. Uh, community searches by foot and multiple police departments. We've searched several locations, including surrounding states. That's kind of interesting. Uh, we will continue to search homes, mountains, rivers. We have had several agencies involved in the searches and in the investigation, including a search of a residential home today. I think that might be the same home the family's talking about, but I'm not 100% sure. And um, there is a lot of misleading information being distributed on social media that isn't factual, which... Yes, you know, I know enough about speaking to families and stuff. Sometimes they, because they're living in this, they're literally thinking about it from second to second. It can really take them to places in terms of, of looking at the facts and stuff that are, they're going to be off mark. Like they're, they're just, they're in pain. They're just, it's in a completely different place. Uh, so you kind of have to realize that, that, you know, Everything that's going to come your way from them, probably not going to be the strongest factual information that you can find. I think you listen anyway, you take in what they're saying. And then if you see points in it where you can say, okay, well, we can go check that out. We can figure out if that's actually true or not. I think that's how you best help a family through that process. Because remember, this family's going through, they're, they're grieving. Every lead that's been given to this agency continues to be investigated. The Pennsylvania information, I'm assuming PA information, was a lady who stated that they may have seen Mr. Taylor in Pennsylvania. Instead of contacting local authorities in Pennsylvania, as Mr. Taylor is entered into NCIC, the individual waits three days and then comes back to West Virginia where she's told a friend and that friend send the information to this agency. As you can imagine, Pennsylvania is a very large state and no more information was given to this office on the incident. I mean, this is this is missing persons investigations. Like you're going to get sightings like that. I I don't you know, it, it's weird cuz once again just whoever's making these posts, there's this kind of semi critical aspect about from the police department's perspective about the public that I don't think is helpful. I don't think it's going to help this community work with this police department better. The WPD has been with the Taylor family throughout this ordeal and have conducted search and searches in Williamson, outside Williamson, throughout West Virginia and Kentucky. So we do get confirmation there are searches that have happened in Kentucky as well. Uh, Sabrina says, you say no human remains have been found, but you say you're continuing to treat this as a missing persons case. They respond, the WPD has to treat this as a missing persons case until such evidence indicates otherwise. And that is certainly true based on what we've seen from numerous other investigations as well. There is a change.org petition that is started and it's started by chastity. So we know that it's coming from the family. Um, the it's, it's very accusatory. It names specific people. Uh, it has a specific theory. It, it states Charles Taylor was last seen leaving his apartment at 5 1 AM. After two months of searching, we later discovered that he was robbed and murdered. They talked about that on Jason's channel as well. They certainly seem to believe that information. Uh, one of the unfortunate things that I know because of being in contact with so many families in this situation is you will hear stories that are 100% false. We have heard of instances where someone will talk about a particular sighting of someone and then their body is found later and they were deceased at the time. We've we've heard the flip of that. We've heard instances where, uh, yeah, that person's been murdered, and then no, we actually do find out that they're fine. They're somewhere else. It's an unfortunate side effect, I think, of people that want to be helpful. They're seeing the pain that the family is in. They think they have some piece of the puzzle. They try to give it to the family, thinking it's going to help them in some way. In some instances, it doesn't. 
some instances it can really be hurtful. And if you really had information that Charles was indeed robbed and murdered, don't run that to the family, run that to law enforcement. Like that, those are the people that need to be processing that information, um, for, you know, to run it to the family and then have the family convey it to law enforcement. You're just, you're adding people to that game of telephone. You're putting other people in between. And ultimately the information is going to either decrease in fidelity, meaning it's not going to be as good as the person that it came from before you tried to relay it to the police department. In some instances, it's going to change. You're not going to get the facts 100% right. Little things that they said don't carry through. The detail just gets stripped out in some way. And in all of the cases where I've been kind of a middle person in information dealing with law enforcement, the first thing they're going to do is just try to get you out of the hoop. They're going to try to go back to the original source to hear the information for themselves. So it's it's just it's really not helpful to take that kind of information and to give it to the family, expecting them to be able to to run with that. That's just not how these things work. And then on top of that, you get side effects like this. I mean, this family could have put themselves in serious legal trouble, financial jeopardy over naming people like that. Like it's just, um, it's, it's unfortunate in, in many ways. If there is a legitimate aspect to that needing to be investigated, the source of that information needs to call law enforcement. It's just that simple. These cases are difficult enough. There is no one person that's going to be the, the one person that solves this case on their own. They're always about teams. The family can't do this on their own. Law enforcement cannot do this on their own. They need the help of the community. They need the help of the public. If they have the backing of the family, sometimes that helps. Um, but assuming the worst, let's assume that the family's correct about this. That means at some point, you're going to hope that there is a trial, that there is a process of trying to get justice for this murder, if it is indeed a murder. Don't you think you're going to need those investigators on your side of the courtroom presenting their, their information to make sure that conviction happens? It's so important that we try to get everyone on the same page and realize you might not like the style or the approach that people are taking, but as long as you have the right end goal of finding a missing person or finding justice for this person whose life has been taken, you want to be on that team or you want to help foster that team. You want to help pull that group of people together. Um, and it's just, it's, believe me guys, I'm, I'm telling you, this Facebook page puts me off. Like every time I look at it, I'm like, these guys, like, what are they doing? Like they're making it really hard to say, Hey, these are the guys I want on my team. I, I get that. But in these instances, you don't have a choice. Like this is the card that you were dealt and you have to figure out how to play it. Or maybe not. Maybe this family finds a different approach to that. We'll get to it, but let's go ahead and continue with another post because this one is extremely interesting. And I'm just going to tell you right now, has basically no update. There's I'm no other information about this. Uh, the WPD is following up on several leads and is currently looking for a person of interest, Rhonda Johnson. Johnson's last known location was around the Ohio area. This is posted on December 23rd, 2020. Who is this person? We don't know. We're, no explanation of relationship. No photo. Rhonda Johnson, fair, probably a fairly common name. So to kind of put this out and then to not close the hoop of, oh, we've actually found her. We've been in contact. We're not looking for her anymore. A little strange. Uh, we have someone that asks about it. It uh, looks like a, a few months after. Has this POI been located? If not, where can a picture and other, and other available additional information be found that would help the public identify this person? No response to that message, which is interesting because this Facebook seems kind of responsive on this stuff. Uh, and then we get another family member here. Why is it that we, the family of Charles Taylor, can never receive a call back, but you guys can make a Facebook update, not informing his family of anything first? Williamson Police looking for person of interest in missing man investigation posted January 8th, 2021 over at WCHS TV. Police said in a December 23rd Facebook post, they're looking for a person of interest, Rhonda Johnson, whose last known location was in the Ohio area. Hopefully you would think, okay, news agency, are they going to be able to kind of dig out that extra information, get a picture, talk about who this is in relation to him? Nope. They're literally just 
you know, uh, putting back out there what, what was already out there, what the Facebook post was, but now it's, it's hitting the news page. They did follow up. They say on Friday, police said that they're still looking for Johnson. So as of two weeks after they make that Facebook post, um, they're still looking for her, haven't found her. I haven't seen any other updates on this aspect at all. I don't know if they ever found her. If they did, they never asked for the public to stop, which is kind of a usual, pretty usual thing that I would see. Like they put out word like that and then they'll go, okay, we found the person. You don't need to keep looking for them. I mean, as reckless as people are worried that the internet can be, um, this is one of those things where, you know, close the hoop, like just what if you had people going nuts on Facebook profiles, reaching out to every Rhonda Johnson saying you have something to do with what happened to our beloved Charles? Like, I don't know. I don't know. So there's another change.org petition. Very, very different tone on this one. Have Williamson Police Department close Charles Taylor's case for the FBI to step in. So they're basically asking for the case to be handed off. The Taylor family greatly appreciates everything that Williamson Police Department has done to help solve the disappearance of Charles Taylor. However, we would like for Williamson Police Department of Williamson, West Virginia, to close his missing persons case so we can have another agency step in. Um, the family's very, very focused on this aspect of closing his missing persons case. I don't understand what that's about. Uh, the case should not actually close, even if it's handed off to another agency. They're still going to keep it as a missing persons case. You can have a missing persons case and still run it as a homicide investigation at the same time. We've we've had law enforcement uh, agencies tell us that directly through the media before that, you know, hey, we know this is a missing persons case, but there is a foul play component. We have, you know, two teams working on this uh, basically in parallel. Um, yeah, I don't I don't know the focus of this closing the case aspect. I don't think that it happens that way. But to be honest, you know, there's so many different police departments in this country that work in very, very different ways that maybe they're seeing some benefit to that that I'm just not understanding. It's been five months since Charles disappeared and we're not getting the answers we need. There's a huge lack of communication and a lack of action. The main focus is finding Charles's remains and we feel as if we if we were to continue on the road that we're on, it'll be years before that is accomplished. And once again, just it's very obvious that the family believes um, the worst has happened in this case. And does that see that's the thing? Closing the case doesn't automatically all of a sudden flip a switch and okay, well, that means it has to be a homicide. That's not necessarily true either because there could have been an accident or something along those lines. There's other conditions here. So honestly, at least having a case open means there's some form of responsibility. Um, you know, there's some way of logging this information that's coming in pertaining to what had happened to Charles, you know, closing that case out. Like, I just, I don't understand the benefit. On January 30th, 2021, there's an update to this petition. WPD is officially off the case. The case is now being handled by the Mingo County, West Virginia State Police. So it does transfer. I don't know if it's because of the petition. Um, I don't know if it's because of the kind of quarreling that seems to be going on publicly around this, or if it's just some type of time frame thing. Like it just, you know, the case was open for a certain amount of time and it was time to hand it to the state police. Sometimes if the police department is uh, smaller, they'll hand it to state police anyway, just because they have better resources for handling something like this. So maybe, maybe it's a combination of all those things. I'm not sure. Um, but that's why we've had the state police department phone number on the screen here this whole time. That's why we want you to call them if you do have information on this case. And I think it's highly likely that there is some social component to this case. Uh, I think there is a very good chance that either people have information about what was going on in the days leading up to his disappearance, possibly the day of his disappearance. Maybe there's people that do have information about what happened after his disappearance. Uh, I think there's a, a really good chance that there is some tip out there that just hasn't been called in on this yet. And we're really hoping that this video gets in front of the eyes of that person and that they find it in their heart to pick up that phone and call that number. Like I mentioned, um, the coverage really trails off. As you've seen in this episode, we were mostly focused on that initial search effort. And then 
kind of getting into some of the stuff that happened on Facebook after that. There's really not much more, but we do get another update at WSAZ.com one year later. It's been more than a year. Chuck has been gone over a year and every day we just stay so upset because somebody knows something, said Sherry Taylor, his mom. I would just really appreciate it if someone would come forward and tell us where is my son's body. Originally, Williamson Police Department Chief Grady Dodson said that no foul play was suspected. The Taylor family requested the case be handed over to the West Virginia State Police. Trooper First Class R.L. Jennings has been on the case since then. At this point, we don't have any evidence showing either way there could be foul play, there could be an accident, anything could have happened, he said. TCF Jennings said that he has interviewed several people, conducted several search warrants and several subpoenas. Troopers believe they have good leads, but are still requesting the public's help if anyone knows any information. We're hoping that somebody, anybody, can step forward and help us out in our investigation in any way whatsoever to give the family some closure, to bring some kind of justice to Mr. Taylor. Troopers said there have been no sightings of Taylor and his bank records have not moved. He would not just run off and start a whole new life without us, said his sister, Dominique Taylor. We would just like someone to please step up, do the right thing, go to law officials, tell us where he is. Taylor's family said he has a specific type of eye disease that allowed him to only see figures and not specific details. His sister, Dominique, has the same disease. We can see figures, but we can't see the fine details of things, she said. My brother would never walk off in the night or early morning when it's still dark outside because we need the light in order to be able to see where we're going. It is a really strange thing. 5.01 in the morning. Why is he leaving at that time? Um, another strange thing, just no mention at all about a cell phone. Like it just, for missing persons investigations now nowadays, like that needs to be step one. And in many cases it is. Um, you know, pulling records, looking for pings, trying to get GPS information, cell phone, cell phone, cell phone, unless it was left in the house. Maybe that's just another one of those details that we haven't got here. Details like, I still don't know his height. I still don't know his weight. I also need his birthday. Uh, confirmation on the clothing description. Like, does his family think that that red and pink striped shirt, like, does that make sense? Is that something that he had worn before? Description on his tattoos. I've got a bunch of things that I need to be able to get this entered in in Amos. So I will be sending uh, his family some messages here and just seeing if I can get that information firmed up so we can get this entry started for them. Here on Facebook, on his mother's page from February 16th this year, rest easy little Chuck, I miss you, with pictures of him as a child. And I guess that's his father with him in this picture on the right. Also, one from his sister. This one posted March 18th this year. Even though I'm missing you really hard today, I know you would want me to smile. I love you. Hashtag Taylor Gang. Uh, there is a Web Sleuths thread. A couple pages going on this. Some good conversation there that you can jump in on. Of course, comment box down below is there also to talk about this case. What do you guys think is going on with it? What do you think the family should be doing as next steps, trying to move things forward? I know there's probably going to be some frustration maybe uh, about law enforcement, how they handle this, what, all that kind of stuff. Uh, let's just try to be fair to everyone. And remember, we're trying to stay focused on efforts that are really going to help find Charles. That's why we do these things. Uh, I know that there's plenty of places where we can go and, and complain about law enforcement. I don't think we necessarily need to do that here. I think... Uh, I think we got the idea, and honestly, we've got a different police department that's working on this now. So looks like the family kind of hit some form of resolution on that. We've mentioned it several times, but Jason Hebert did do the interview with the family as well. I'll have a link to that down in the description box down below. There is this Justice for Charles Taylor page. I, it's not updated very often. I would think if there was some significant development, it's probably going to be posted here. I mean, their last postings from March 2021. Um, but honestly, we haven't had really significant developments since then. So you might want to go ahead and give this a like so that you're following, uh, information there. A really concerning case, just a troubling situation right off the bat. Someone that is considered legally blind, uh, going missing in this manner. 
a bunch of unanswered questions, uh, not great communication going on between the family and law enforcement, not great communication going on between law enforcement and media, no real investigative reporter kind of taking this up, trying to fill in the pieces. I mean, honestly, none of the news reports even really talked all that much. There was one that kind of gave us some insight into Charles and, and his family structure. There's just a lot missing from this case. And I think that's why it needs more inten- attention. I think it needs more people to care about it, to be asking, where is Chuck? How do we stand behind this family? Uh, what's going on with these lingering issues? Have we identified this Rhonda Johnson person? Has that investigative lead been closed out? Is Are there other people that we should be looking for? Can we confirm some things like the clothing description? Do we know that that's solid for that day? Um, I don't know. There's, there's a lot that is, it just feels not processed well with this case. And I can't imagine where that leaves the family. I mean, at, at that point, think about it. If you were feeling like, you know, you weren't sure if, if the investigation was, was going well, wouldn't you grab your notebook and, and start trying to find out for yourself start going to scenes, start asking questions, maybe enter a home without the permission of the owner. Like I really, from what I'm seeing from the family, all of it is understandable when you're talking about the fear and the reality that they're facing, that they have a loved one that hasn't been seen for, it's going to be, it's going to be two years in a few months. So I, I don't think any of that is, is hard to understand in this. I just really hope that the state police are getting a fair shake with this uh, because, you know, they picked it up a pretty good chunk of time after it actually happened. Hopefully the the evidence, the information that they're looking for is still out there. And I hope that the person that has it will call it in and let them do their job and, and bring some answers to this family. I really appreciate you guys so much. Thanks for staying with me here on this episode of Brain Scratch Searchlight. Also a big thank you to new patrons. Thank you, Miriam, and thank you, Michelle. We really appreciate you helping to support us here at Lord and Arts. If you want to do the same, please visit lordandarts.com. There you can sign up for Patreon, sign up for PayPal, buy merchandise, or just buy us a coffee like Margaret Peters recently did. Thank you so much. Take care, be safe, have a nice weekend, and please join us again on Monday for a brand new episode of Case Cracked right here on the Lord and Arts channel. <laughs>